Dave, I'm very excited to talk about this topic and it's you're quite a book reader and a plier and uh, would you just give a brief introduction on the book the title and then i have a number of questions i wanted to explore absolutely so yeah so tonight we're going to talk about how the mighty fall by jim collins and uh, for those who haven't heard of it people may or be more familiar with his with collins's more famous book it was called good to great and uh, the, so, so How the Mighty Fall was actually a book that he wrote. It was intended, it was starting out as an article and as a follow-up piece. And he ended up uh, doing a, another research project, not quite the same scale as good to great, but examining what were, what did companies have in common when they were very successful and appeared to be bulletproof and then went downhill. Now, one of the things, if you haven't read Jim Collins to understand, and one of the things I really like about Collins is that he has a, a pretty disciplined research methodology that he uses for his material, and he followed the same basic pattern that he did with good to great. And part of what makes it, it pretty self-evident when he presents the data is it's not just a bunch of theories that Jim Collins came up with off of the top of his head. And in fact, he was emphatic about having his research team apply a methodology that did not start with a theory, but to actually start with data. And <clears throat> he talks about this, at the, his methodology at greater length and good to great, but essentially he'll start with a body of companies like in good to great. He had uh, all of the companies that were publicly traded between 1955 and 1985. And then he said, okay, we're going to narrow those down to only the ones that meet very specific criteria. So in good to great, it was the ones that had 15 years of mediocre performance as defined by trading at or below the general stock market, followed by 15 years of sustained great performance defined by trading at three times or more the value of the general stock market. And they said, okay, once we assemble these body of, of companies, that's going to be what determines they, they spent five years studying those companies. So he, he used that same general type of approach in how the mighty fall. And so what I'm going to talk to about tonight, essentially, he, he, they started with data. They looked at the companies and they had a comparison company in each case. So they'll always have a company that did well versus a company that didn't do well. And they'll look at, OK, what were all what did the companies that did well? What did they have in common versus the ones that did not do well? What did those companies have in common? And he would always compare them side by side. So in, in How the Mighty Fall, Collins basically found that there were five stages of decline that companies would go through when when they seem to be like i said seem to be bulletproof but then would just go through this rapid decline and he starts off in the introduction talking about bank of america and he actually gives the story of how bank of america started in the beginning and it was just like you get this this picture of a really determined rugged bootstrap entrepreneur type that was just determined and had it was visionary and then he said you, you would you wouldn't even believe that you know, how many years later that, you know, if you saw what happened after 1980 in Bank of America, where just so many things, you know, just it was a snowball effect, you wouldn't even believe it was the same company. And so part of what he did was he looked at the different patterns that can can set into place. And, you know, one of the one of the things so I'll go through just the, the five stages of decline, because that's really the framework for this whole book that Collins talks about. So the first stage that he found was was called hubris born of success as he calls it and hubris is actually a uh, it, it, it's a the word specifically refers to being negligent uh and because of the fact that you believe that there there's nothing you're 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 impenetrable the second stage is undisciplined undis pursuit of more the third third stage is denial of risk and peril the fourth stage is grasping for salvation and the fifth stage is capitulation to irrelevance or death. Now, one of the things is, you know, the, the, it, it is possible to come back from almost rock bottom. That we, and, and that's one of the things that he touches on a little bit in here is that, you know, there, there are businesses that came back after reaching rock bottom and then there's businesses that didn't. And so one of the, so there's a few distinctions that he makes in here. But uh, you know what I did in preparation for this talk is I actually started going back through a catalog of small brick and mortar businesses that I've worked with, and here's here's where I'm going to be very perfectly candid is I'm I'm going to be kind of walking a tightrope tonight because I need to be specific enough to kind of give information about what my experience is, but vague enough that I don't embarrass anybody by revealing who they are. <laughs> so right, right. Uh, that's that's one of the the interesting things about telling these business stories sometimes. 
Uh, but I'll tell you, I'll actually start with one that I can tell you about because everyone knows about it already. One of my, actually my first job uh, at, when I came out of tech school in the late 90s was working for uh, Lucent Technologies, which was a spinoff of AT&T. And you can read about all this in the paper, and it's been written about in several different books. But essentially, they were, I mean, what seemed to be sitting on the nose cone of a rocket is what Jim Collins would put it. This was when the dot-com boom was happening, and the the, the division I was working in had uh, was making fiber optic lasers. It was lasers for fiber optic applications, and that market was just exploding. I mean, people were, I, mean, the, the, I was working in a facility where they couldn't get product out the door fast enough, and they didn't care about paying overtime or anything like that. It was just... I mean, there was the demand was just so enormous that the the biggest constraint on the ability to make money was how fast can we build more machines and hire more people, and you know, how much product can we get out the door? And, and I remember the, the facility that I worked in actually quadrupled its size and output over a period of four years, and it, it's kind of hard to imagine what that's like without seeing it because they, I mean, just just watching how fast the the expansion of the facility, how fast the footprint grew how fast you saw new people coming in the door. I mean, we, I mean, we'd have people that came in and were being hired their first week and saying, you better learn fast because next week you're going to be training somebody. And that was because that was the kind of predicament that it was. And I remember toward the, like right at, at the time when you could start reading in the newspaper about the mass layoffs at Lucent, there was, and, and that I believe was 2001. There was six months before the layoffs happened there, it was still just this crazy hyper growth mode, and it was virtually overnight that that the market just disappeared. The market just dried up, and nobody was buying any of the stuff anymore. And I remember just sitting there, we're, we're just kind of all looking around. We got this highly specialized equipment, and there's no use for it because it's just sitting there on the floor. And uh, you know, so that was kind of for me one of my first eye openers about you know, that there's there's no such thing as a guaranteed job there's no such thing as a business that's just going to that's going to be an un, unlimited gravy train but uh, i remember the mentality up to that point was you know this is they're, they're sitting on a gold mine that's never going to go dry and uh, yeah a lot of people unfortunately learned some hard lessons about that thankfully it was i got off fairly easy because you know, I I hadn't uh, had done what some of my coworkers had done, which was they went out and bought expensive cars and boats and and bigger houses and all this kind of stuff, and then ended up saddled with a lot of debt. Uh, fortunately, I didn't do that. My lifestyle didn't change, and and there were some some number of people uh, with a lot of different experiences there. But you know, it's a classic case of of a lot of the different points that that Collins talks about here. Uh, so that that's that's essentially the the framework. So I'll run back through those five stages again. So you've got hubris born of success. You've got that leads to undisciplined pursuit of more. Then you've got denial of risk and peril, and then you have grasping for salvation, the last stage, and then there's capitulation to irrelevance or death. And I mean, I, I, we can definitely run through plenty of examples of what those all look like from the standpoint of a, of a privately owned brick and mortar small business. But that's that's basically an overview of what the book is. So, Martin, I want to just kind of come back to you for a second. Yeah. Just if you have any, any thoughts on well, what that general concept I'd like to take, we just did an interview with Skyview Skate Land, which we'll put mm -hmm. in the link as well. And I think it's an example of uh, applying it. It's a roller skating ring that met me because they realized they were behind the times in online marketing. It was a brother and sister that ran it. There was competition in another location and more funds, better location, everything. Then they learned that skill and started building up. And then the COVID shutdown looked like it was going to shut them down. And then they were able to push the limit, survive and stay in communication, get back open. And then they found they had water damage. It looked like they had a hundred grand bill that could have wiped them out. They got a GoFundMe-like site going. And luckily, it turned out to cost less. And now they're back in business Go, doing a very good idea. So if if you can map anything onto that, then our listeners could go back and rehear that of what did they do right and where could they have fall, failed in some of these different components. 
Absolutely. I think it's a really interesting way to put a spin on this because Skyview Skateland, from what I know about this and from, from the interview that we did and from some of our conversations, they would not qualify for this book because they did. So essentially, there's no element of hubris born of success. There, there's a, I would say you kind of flip that to the opposite. There's a humility. And you know, there's also, I, I kind of got a sense of there is a a humility and, and an element of gratitude and recognizing that and knowing the difference between success that you've worked hard and earned and versus success that came from luck. Uh, because even companies that work hard and build a good company, they still benefit from luck to some degree. And that's one of the things that Jim Collins talked about in good to great, you know, from one of the, what he calls the level five leaders or the ones that were the the, the strongest was whenever things went badly, they would take accountability for it. And when things went well, they would say, well, I got, I was surrounded with great people and we just got lucky at a, a number of different occasions versus the level four leaders, the ones that, that weren't, uh, that were ineffective would say they'd be patting themselves on the back and be like, look at what, a, look what a great leader I am. Look, see, yeah. and so that's the characteristic that shows up when you have the hubris born of success. So that's the one piece that I definitely do not see in Skyview Skateland. Well, and I, I want to challenge that because I'm not sure before I met them, they weren't close to that. Because uh, remember, they had been working and successful, just having the doors. It was second generation. They were going along. They didn't mm -hmm. really have any. They had a self-made website. They didn't have any social presence. They didn't have any videos. And they were starting to see the decline. So I'm not sure they weren't before I met close to that, mm -hmm. you know, and then they went, my gosh, you know, we got to do something or uh, we are noticing a decline in participation. So, I mean, I, I think we're, it, it's definitely a spectrum. We're all guilty of it to some yeah. degree or another. I think it's a matter of to what degree does it, be, does it create unmanageability and, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're all prone to slipping into that hubris born of success and, and I think a lot of it would, would, you know, comes down to just failure to recognize when I've genuinely earned success versus when did it just drift in my direction for reasons that I didn't particularly earn. And I think that it's, if we start taking credit for successes, we didn't really earn, that's when it can turn into hubris. And then we start thinking that things actually worked well when we actually did something that was not a good idea, but we still got success despite the fact that it didn't work well. I think when we don't make a, a distinction between that, and, and I think to your point, I'm, I'm sure any business I can name, even the best business out there has been guilty of that at some point and probably is guilty of it to some degree today. So, yeah, I mean, it, so, yeah, that I think that's that's one lens we can look at it. Um, but if we go to the rest, you know, the, the next piece in Collins's model that undisciplined pursuit of more. You know, the, the, what I could hear, and, and obviously, you know, this particular business better than I do, but I know that that in the interview that we did, I, I could hear the discipline in their growth. I mean, you know, there was a, a specific strategy behind how the, the owner of Skyview built really key relationships in the community and then with other skate parks, and then also really sat down and said, okay, how do we want to grow this company? And, you know, so there, the, the, to me, the difference between disciplined growth versus undisciplined growth is there's some kind of a deliberate strategy in place. And there's also a slowing down and a pause and they're saying, okay, you know, the, the undisciplined companies will basically say yes to every opportunity. And I've actually met, uh, there's one business owner I can think of in particular that, that actually said, uh, they had a philosophy of never say no to an opportunity, and mm -hmm. they were proud of that. To me, that's the hallmark of an undisciplined company because I don't care how how many good opportunities run across; they're not all good opportunities. <laughs> so well, I want to talk about that because yeah. uh, one of the it's important to add on new value, especially you know. So you might sell T-shirts, and you might have other income streams, but you also have to look at how far that is. And what's the learning curve for it? So an example is Skyview. Uh, she found a group that was doing STEM programs that she could join up, pay them a certain amount, and they would help her understand how to apply it and use it. And But then that's an add-on for their space. You know, that's utilizing their space versus maybe uh, just renting it out as a dance hall or just going to something way outside their comfort zone is a yes. So I think that's a important component is 
is this something we, we're going to have to work hard to do it, but can we get it out there as a test? And can, what would it cost to test it out and see if it takes hold? And she's done that with, uh, they sell skates. And of course, you you could potentially buy some of the skates or a version of them cheaper online. But then she's looked at, I need to educate people on how you don't want to buy a skate online. You need to get it set up. And if you don't, you're going to have to pay that difference for us to do it for you or get it from us. So I think that's how that might fit in. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's it's a great example of when you talk about the the STEM programs. You know, the, the thought process has always got to be okay. If I'm going to rent out my space, what who am I renting it to for what purpose, and is is this actually going to feed my business model, or is this going to create a distraction? Is this going to potentially dilute my brand? Is this going to send the wrong message? Is this you know is this going to actually generate more costs and tie up my staff and create more labor? and constrain me from doing more of the things that are going to make money is it actually going to end up losing money that's that's actually one of the things that collins gets into in one of his other books was called great by choice where he was talks about the difference between firing bullets and firing cannonballs which is you know you fire bullets they're cheap and they don't you know there's no risk involved you just burn a few cheap bullets and then if you say okay i guess that didn't work you can you can it's no harm no foul versus you know the businesses that you know they get excited about an idea and they fire a cannonball and then if you only got two more cannonballs left and you're out in the middle of the ocean you can't get any more you know that that's kind of the the distinction there so yeah i mean i think there's a lot you can see that pattern a lot in the the distinction between disciplined versus undisciplined growth and businesses but there's a couple that came to mind for me there were small businesses that i knew there's two i can think of in specific that opened a second location when the first location was not doing well mm -hmm. and part of the thought process that that i heard which i did not agree with and still don't agree with was well maybe if we just you know you, you have to just take a leap of faith and take a risk and and just go for it and you know, maybe if we can get two stores going, then that'll feed everything. But as far as I'm concerned, if you can't make it work with one store, you you really don't have a prayer of making two stores work. So that that's one example I've seen. Or the other piece of adding service lines, particularly when it involves hiring staff to do things that you don't know how to do yourself. Mm -hmm. Does that involve purchasing large amounts of inventory and you don't know how it's whether it's going to sell or not? You know, there's so many different things that come in when you're thinking about deciding how you're going to going to grow. But I think the biggest pattern I see with small businesses is when you think about the service component and you think about the relationship component is that what happens is they start taking on more and more clients without realizing, without knowing what their numbers are, without having a true view of what their costs of delivery look like. And what happens is their service starts to deteriorate. They burn bridges, their relationships go out the window and then that's actually the main thing that made their business successful was their was those relationships and so so i think part of what you have to do when you when you're a, a small business is you actually got to think about some of the intangibles and the harder things to measure such as the value of your own time uh mm -hmm. because that doesn't show up on your balance sheet or your p l statement it's harder to measure but part of what you have to factor in is that when you're doing all the work yourself as the owner, you care about it more than your employees ever will. And so when you're a brick and mortar business and you start hiring more employees and turning things over to your employees, well, first of all, it's going to cost you money to do things that used to be free. And it's going to take them more time than it took you to do. The quality is not going to be as good because they're not going to care about it as much. And you've got to worry about things like, are they dishonest? Are they going to steal from you? Are they going to milk the clock? Mm -hmm. And so if you grow your small business in an undisciplined manner, and you just think that every opportunity is a good opportunity, I mean, you can get underwater really fast. And I think this, these are some of these takeaways that for, it's actually worse for a brick and mortar business, for a, for a small business that doesn't have the kind of cash reserves that these larger companies have that Collins talked about, because you know they, they have deep enough pockets pockets to be able to withstand they can make some pretty big screw ups and still come back but one mistake like this can put a brick and mortar uh business a, a company out of business so. well I, I, one i think of is a a restaurant a, a restaurant that had kind of a fast food unique product and they had a reputation issue they got it cleaned up they had to do retraining they had staff that was not uh, natural born citizens, and they really needed that staff. It was how they ran it. And then they just started building out 
just countless opening store after store after store. And I could see where they had just barely got together the process to keep their people trained and function. Then they opened another and it already started to deteriorate in reputation. Then another. And, and it, I'm thinking of the idea of a couple that thinks, hey, if we have kids, you'll fix our relationship problems. You know, it's like, that's yep. what comes to mind. You know, and I watched it just decay. It was so painful because I had seen all the work they had done to build up their reputation. And then they were scaling too rapidly. So I think that might be another one uh that could uh, is an example of absolutely yep no i mean it's you know look it's funny because collins actually talks about when he looks at the undisciplined pursuit of more and then the next piece which is denial of risk and peril a lot of his examples he talks about mergers and acquisitions and how you have companies that are limping along and not doing well trying to acquire their way to greatness by thinking okay well, i'll just acquire a, a rock star company and then that'll be the answer to everything and you know, like he always said, you can't two mediocre companies don't you can't stick them together and make one great company. And uh, one of the one of the things that when you look at denial and risk and of risk and peril, you know, one of the things that I, I've seen as a pretty common indicator of that is when you have essentially companies that and this is especially true in industries that have a disruptor, an external disruptor. So let's say, for example, I remember between 2010 and 2012. The internet really started to come to, to, to disrupt a number of different things when smartphones became an everyday thing for most people. That's when also the, the, the period when more people had high speed internet and the world just started to become a lot more interconnected. I mean, I, I got email on my phone for the first time, probably around 2010 or so. Mm -hmm. And there's all these just little, then that's when social media, you had LinkedIn, people started to look for jobs on LinkedIn. Uh, to the degree that they heard of it. But there was a lot of people like I remember you and I met uh, at one of your LinkedIn trainings, Martin, that was, mm -hmm. I think, 2007. Mm -hmm. And that was when people still hadn't heard of LinkedIn or you know, and Facebook still wasn't around yet. But that's there was a there was a lot of a lot of that change happening. And one of the industries because I did, I was in I was doing marketing pretty heavily for 10 years. And, you know, the internet just really disrupted a lot of conventional marketing. I mean, it used to be that you, you've, if you could just throw enough money at advertising, you were guaranteed to get customers. Uh, you know, I've, I've met uh, countless you know, small business owners that had actually built up successful businesses by advertising in the yellow pages. And mm -hmm. they were just annoyed that it didn't work anymore because mm -hmm. that it's, you know, people started moving away from that and they started going to phones and other digital media and, you know, so when you look at the, the component of denial and ri of risk and peril, it's the idea of just kind of taking as a given that if something has worked for a long enough amount of time, I can I can just assume that it'll always work forever because something that's been working this long, it can't possibly fail now if it's been working for the last 20 years. You know, you know the, that uh, idea that longevity of, of, of a strategy guarantees future performance. And so uh, with a couple of ways that I've seen that, you know, with, with print advertising in general, not even just the yellow pages, but magazine advertising, I mean, you, you have to be more and more strategic to be able to get a return on investment. And so a lot of the, the people that sell advertising or marketing agencies have just had to, to really adapt to that. Uh, and, and so those are just a couple of things that I see coming into play with, with uh, the denial of risk and peril, but in a bigger way, in 2020, COVID hit. I think that was the uh, the the denial shattering hit for a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. It was it was finally something that was blunt enough that nobody could actually could deny it and say it didn't matter. That was kind of the interesting thing about that. I think some of the the trends that happened before were just as impactful, but for whatever reason, if people will deny something as long as they possibly can when it's something they didn't want to hear. But I, I'm kind of curious, Martin, have you ever run it? I mean, what are some examples of people you've run into where, you know, you, have you ever had a kind of conversation of, hey, you know, you, you really ought to be worried about this. And then the business owner says, yeah, that's that's not going to affect me. That's it's fine. Well, that, the, you know, the yellow pages, of course, one, because they thought, well, I get all my money from it. I'm going, look, people are taking it from their front door and putting it in the recycle bin now. <laughs> and it's and then that that's an example. Uh, and uh, another point I was thinking of that popped in is small papers, small town papers. What occurred is the larger companies bought them up. And then they thought, well, they're there. I'll just pump outside content in. And they literally killed them 
because the value the paper had is people seeing themselves in the paper. That was their competitive advantage. And so then when they just put other content because they bought it, uh, it, it killed the paper. While even a newspaper in a small town could still be viable if it allowed for advertisements, some interest, kind of a cross between uh, something you'd pick up and read while you're sitting and having lunch, and there's some interest there and novelty, but also showcasing people in the town. And the, the one paper I know in Ocracoke's still going, and they have focused on how do they bring the attention of local, but also make it work for tourists coming to the area. So it serves as kind of a tourist guide one on a regular basis, but also has enough local stories to get people's interest. And they have people across the United States signing up to receive it because it's a feeling of nostalgia. So that's an example to me of adapting to this versus not paying attention to the writing on the wall and that they they better move. And an example of a restaurant that I remember uh, died where I loved it. There was a little breakfast place I used to meet a client at. And I said to him, people are going to Google Maps. It was called something. It's been like five versions. But I said, you need to update that. And he goes, why don't do the computer? And I go, well, you opened another store and the, the map listing says it's an Italian restaurant and you're a Southern comfort food breakfast place. He goes, why don't do the computer? And I watched that place die. It was painful because I liked the place. I, I knew the waiters and waitresses. That was, you know, it was a personal down to earth. And then he still didn't do it. And I watched it slowly implode because all he had to do is get somebody to sit down with him and show him how to update the free listing. But he wasn't willing to learn a new behavior. And this in, in small business, I, I one of my quotes is, uh, the, a human being in a business would rather have a root canal without painkiller than learn one new behavior that would save their business. So the, the fact is, is it worth it to retool myself and learn a new skill or am I just shooting in the dark? And I think this is what this book is war warning against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's, you know, that's exactly some of the same kind of pattern I saw that, that started around 2010 and 2012. And it wasn't just technology. It was, you know, technology was kind of the superficial aspect to it, but the idea that, that you really had to, you know, part of what I saw happening as the world started to get more and more connected, and we're now in a in a we're we're trying to do business in a sphere where my customers everywhere and my competitors everywhere at the same time. You really had to be a lot more deliberate and a lot more strategic. And I just I found a lot of a lot of small businesses simply just did not want to do that because it wasn't what they were used to doing. To your point, it's it involves learning new behaviors that are mm -hmm. unfamiliar. And one of the things that that, that started to, to shift as far as is advertising and also the delivery of, of products and services was the the need to really just hone in and focus on one small market at a time. So if you think about search engine optimization, for example, or social media or anything like that, I mean, there's on the one hand, you know, the old way of doing advertising is you could basically just spend a lot of money on one ad that's the same for everybody, because if it's a billboard, what choice do you have? You're only going to get one billboard and everybody sees the same one, or if it's one magazine ad, you know, but versus now you've got a chance with something like search engine optimization to be more dynamic. And you now actually could target different types of users based on their search intent online. That means you could actually create a whole bunch of new ads that speak to different messages, speak to different audiences and different situations. But that, that means you also got to do the work to figure out what that is and, and research who those markets are and what they're interested in buying. And, and it's going to be changing all the time. And yeah, so I see that. And, and also with social media, especially when it was newer, that there were a lot of businesses that had the mentality of, okay, who do I need to just cut a check to that they can just do my social media for me, but I don't want to touch this. I don't want to learn anything about it because uh, I, I don't have time for that stuff. That was the mentality. And unfortunately with any kind of a new platform or a new technology or a new approach, 
there is to some degree, you, you've got to learn how to embrace it yourself. Like you got to do, do the homework and sit, sit in that seat and understand how is it actually used? What's the utility and why do people use it? And, and all those kinds of things I got, you know, going back to your interview that when you talked about with Skyview, mm -hmm. I got the sense that, that, you know, the owner of Skyview definitely did that. I mean, she mm -hmm. definitely was deliberate and sat down and, and figured out how, you know, what, what does it mean to take ownership of the strategy myself, because I'm the one who's going to absorb the cost or benefit from the, from the, the fruits, if this goes, depending on how well this goes, you know, in versus trying to, to take a, a delegated hand off, hands off approach. Mm -hmm. So one of the other pieces I want to, I want to touch on tonight here is you've got, so Jim's, Jim Collins's fourth piece of his structure you've got grasping for salvation he calls it and you can see this in, in everything that he write in all of his different books but the idea that you know when things are not going well when you when we're past the point of denial when it's when it's no longer you know, let's just say once once you run red enough months in a row it's kind of hard to, to live in denial much longer and so what happens is you know there, there are the businesses that say okay i'm going to acknowledge the reality of what's going on and I'm going to ask the, the hard question of how do I get back to the fundamental disciplines that we built our success on? And, and Collins has examples of those. And then the, the counter example is, is what he calls grasping for salvation, which is, you know, let's, let's roll out this big aggressive program. Let's do a U-turn and get into some whole different business. Basically, the, the pattern is trying to shake things up and making radical change in the hopes that, you know, this big idea that we're going to try, that's going to be the thing that finally saves us. And it, almost universally, the, it has the opposite effect and you get even deeper into the hole. And that's what pushes you finally to stage five of deny of, of capitulation to irrelevance or death, because you, you, know, you, you try grasping for salvation so many times you, you can't afford to get that wrong too many times and so that's one of the things that i've seen with small businesses that when, when they get to the point of grasping for salvation usually it's cash flow problems but it'll be rolling out new service lines trying to start new businesses launching new websites and changing their message and i think what the allure is a lot of times for a small business is that they may grasp for salvation by doing things that don't necessarily involve laying out a large amount of cash or doing anything that appears to be much of a commitment. It, it appears to be pretty safe, but the problem is if you change your message and you spread yourself thin, uh, you know, the thing is as a small business owner, the only thing that you, that you've got is your time. And so if you start spreading your time thin, that's the most valuable asset in some ways in your company. And so if you spread that thin and you use that poorly, yeah, it, it's it's going to have the same effect as if you spent a lot of money that you didn't have because you're you know. So I'm I'm curious, Martin, if if, if you have have you seen what what is grasping for salvation look like when you see small businesses do that? Well, I mean the the, the restaurant I mentioned, you go in and it was less and less and less, and uh and and you could see, you know I was telling the the waiters, if you ever need a referral, here's my card. So it's kind of, but the tough thing is, is when you build a business like this, it's almost like your right hand. So it's harder to do that. I think that's where you really need to make sure you're grounded in watching the numbers, because that's kind of your litmus test of what you focus on is, look, you know, what do we need to do? And that's where Skyview sat down uh, when the, the state was locking her down and said, I need to go talk to the sheriff. If I, if I keep closed another so many days, I've gone to the mayor, the governor. He made exceptions with alcohol, but he won't make any other exceptions. He's killing our small town. And I need to make a decision, either open or die. Luckily, the time when she said, I'm going for it, because otherwise I'll just have to close, happened to come right around the time they started to open up again. But these are tough decisions to, to make. And one of the things I really want to close with, and, and then we'll uh, open up for a few questions, is, uh, you know, what are some of the, I want to make sure you cover all the components. I think we're on four now. Yeah, we're on four out of five. So we'll touch we'll on the last one briefly. Yeah. And we've been, you know, tips on bouncing back and also warning signs where they need to like have a heads up and be paying attention to it. And then weave in at least the fifth. So we get all five yep. of them in this. 
Absolutely. So, so, I mean, the thing about bouncing back and, and one of the examples Collins talks about there was, uh, was IBM and there was the, this, the former CEO, Lou Gerstner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he said, apparently at one point the, the press came to him and they asked him, what's, when are you going to come forward with uh, the turnaround plan? Mm -hmm. And he said, there's not going to be one. And, and I believe it was, I hope I'm not misquoting him, but I think he, it was Gerstner who had said at one point, the last thing this company needs is a vision. And he, he said, it's like, there, there's not going to be anything exciting or interesting. He said, we're just going to have to do, you know, a, a lot of small things better and just get back and just do a lot. You know, we're going to, it's, it's not going to be any one big thing that's going to turn it around. It's a bunch of small things. And it, it sounds like a lot of people were kind of just frustrated and disappointed in that response because we're trained to expect that hey, you're going to come out with this big, bold vision and, and great promises and all that kind of stuff. And then the you know, similar to that the one I always think about was, was Steve Jobs when he came back and took over Apple after it was going down the tubes in the 90s and how he had said famously, we're going to innovate our way out of this. But the difference is that he knew that he built that company on innovation. He actually knew how to build a company in an innovative manner. And one of the one of the things that he did was to actually cut back and, and, and slash a lot of product lines that had been distractions and focus on what can we actually innovate well. And, and so those are a couple of different distinctions about turning things around versus the companies that didn't do well during that fifth stage that, that moved into that fifth stage of, of capitulation was they, they would just keep flopping around like a fish in a boat, just keep grasping for salvation one thing at a time until it was finally too late and they couldn't come back from it. But as far as the warning signs, well, a couple of things that I look at, uh, and I think that for a small businesses, a lot, mo a lot of small business owners will look at their balance sheet and their P and L statement on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, and that and that's great. It's a good start. But frankly, my my philosophy is that if there's a problem, by the time it shows up on your P and L statement, it's too late because your P and L statement is really a lagging indicator. It's you know you've got you've got to really look at what the leading indicators are, and so that actually takes a lot more effort. But it's but it's not too hard. But to your point, Martin, it, it does require changing certain behaviors. And so one simple you know, behavior would be to start you know, keeping track of how many new customers walked into the store today. You know, it, it's you know of the the 85 customers who came in, how many of them were new ones? How many of them were repeat customers? And start could could you tell me what that number was in your store? And you know, if if the number of new of customers walking into your store is dropping down, what are your customer generating activities? And how disciplined are you about actually doing those customer generating activities? Whether that's advertising, whether it's networking, whether that's going out and connecting with other businesses, whether that what whatever that is. You know, have you actually written down a customer acquisition plan and committed to what those activities are going to be on a monthly basis to, to be proactive and go out, you know, doing things to make the phone ring and to generate interest in your, your business? And are you tracking, you know, how consistently are you executing? Because if you're watching your leading indicators and you say, okay, I said I was going to do these things to generate more business. And for the last month, I only executed 30% of what I said I was going to, then it, it shouldn't be a surprise when you see the lagging indicators drop off when you hit the, the, the P&L. But if you're only watching the lagging indicators, you're only watching the financial statements, it's going to feel like it's just random luck or chance. It's just going to feel like, oh, you know, the, the wind just blew in a different direction and I don't know why. So those are a couple of, so there, there's a lot of different leading indicators. You can look at those were just a couple examples I gave. We could probably go through, you know, 40 or 50 of them if we had time. But I think that's really the gen, the main takeaway is, do you know what your leading indicators are of success? Do you know what you can measure today in terms of how many seeds did you plant? How many actions did you take to move your company in the right direction? Recognizing that you won't see the results of those indicators for probably 60 to 90 days down the road. Well, I think one more thing to add to it uh, that's so important in a small business is don't let go of the people who are currently feeding you for a new project, because that's the great example of that is J.C. Penney's. You know, they had women that would come there. They had their credit cards. They got there. They got their discount coupons. 
and they were keeping the lights on for the most part. And then they brought in someone who criticized all those women. You know, the coupons are fake. We know it's bogus. We have this new store. And so they were then catering for a younger group at the expense of those that fed them. And then there was a dentist's office I knew where they wanted to go for all the more expensive cosmetic dentistry, change their whole website on it. But the fact it was keeping the lights on is the family dentistry. So changing it too rapidly, keeping make sure you have that base and slowly introduce it is an important piece. Absolutely. This, this was a good cover. At least we got an introduction. Well, uh, let's take a minute. We'll see if uh, any comments in the chat or something they want to add. And then we'll wrap it up. I mentioned this is part of our brick and mortar initiative that Dave and I are working on. We'll have links below that have the information. And our next show, which I'm looking forward to, is talking about creating a downtown merchants group uh, in a small town and a visitor center and hearing their experience and their challenges along their journey. So this was fantastic. Well, thanks everybody for coming tonight. And that this has been, this has been great. And we'll I'll definitely be doing more of these interview type formats and, and we'll get into other business books. How do we bring, we, we learn from the, the lessons of big business to help small businesses avoid making some of the same mistakes. Uh, so, uh, Thanks, everyone, for coming. I look forward to seeing you at a future session.